Hello, it's Monday and it's time for relaxing painting once again with Dyson Dungeons. Um, once again, it's time for relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons. You can mix those words up in all sorts of different directions and uh, get a different effect, right? It's like eats, shoots, and leaves. Where do you put the commas? So maybe today what we'll do is we'll talk about grammar. Or not. Um, so it's uh, the Monday after daylight savings time. And that means we have all sprung forward, those of us who have daylight savings time. So it's a little darker this morning, but we get a little bit more light in the evenings, especially this time of the year as we approach the uh, spring equinox, uh, solstice, right? No, equinox. Yep, equinox, spring, heights of March, all of that sort of thing, uh, all coming together making the days longer, giving us a little more sun, and you'll be glad to know that the tradition continues and the day of streaming, relaxing painting is also a day of precipitation. So we got snow started last night and it's continuing today. Um, I think we've broken that streak only once in the last three weeks at least. I haven't gone back and looked at the weather from all of that time, but it seems that um, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays are precipitation days, at least here in West Michigan, and we're continuing that today by getting, oh, I don't know, it looks like there's like three inches and more coming, but this is fairly light snow. It's not that really heavy, mushy snow like we got last Friday. Um, so what we're continuing today with is uh, mini figs. was working on these guys on Friday and it felt like I spent the entire stream hardly getting anywhere but as I'm looking at them today it looks like they're mostly finished I've got one more base coat color to put on and that's kind of a buff color that's going to be going on the legs and the sleeves okay um, once I get that on, then I'll probably have to do some dark brown touch-up because there's a lot of tricky little boundaries here. And I, you know, hopefully I won't have to do too many colors of touch-up, but there's a chance there'll be some red. And if the brush slips, who knows? Who knows? It could be any color. Um, I also have to do some dark gray touching up all over the model because in the course of getting all the other colors on, um, that got uh, painted over in a few spots as well. So I'll be going over these and doing base coat touch up. And then once that's done, you see the camera's over to the left here today. Um, once that's done, then I'm not gonna mess around with this very much. I'm going to get a uh, brown or umber to decide which. Yeah, I know, it just never seems to let up, does it? it uh, six more weeks of winter wasn't kidding this year. It's just lingering. March, this time of the year is so weird. There have been early March weeks like this where... Um, of course it does. You, I mean, that's Michigan winter is... The really bright sunny day you get up and you go, I don't have to go anywhere today. And the roads are clear and uh, the sun is shining, which is a very, very rare event, right? Um, here in West Michigan during the period from November until April. So, uh, yeah. It is, and it's not really letting up. It's still snowing, so that means that everything isn't really fully plowed and they can't be and yeah but that's the the upside of actually being retired is that you can get up and look at the snow and say oh isn't that pretty it'll probably be cleared up sometime later this week and i've got plenty of groceries so i don't have to go out but it's yeah it's good to 
it's good to have this though because it gives us something to complain about other than falling against among ourselves uh let's see what else what's happened friday was grumpy day i think you all remember that so that was that was a day where we just celebrated grumping about everything so use that up and probably can't bring it back again for a while so i can't i can't be too grumpy today just you know a modest amount of standardized grump uh yeah so we're gonna be putting buff on the legs there isn't much on this one maybe a little bit underneath we'll see how far up i up this mock up paint and then and then the sleeves so we'll finish those up and then i'm going to put like a, a very light amount of brown or umber wash on the brown parts the buff and the dark brown just because there's there's a lot of folds in the uh, in the print and I want those to show I don't want it to look all grungy or anything like that but I do want to be able to bring out some of the detail so I'm not going to be putting very much on and I'm going to try to keep it pretty uniform except um, like in the sleeves and things like that hopefully it will look okay uh, I might put a little bit of black wash on the arrowhead it's really shiny so sometimes a little bit of black wash up that doesn't change it but it tones it down a bit and maybe the head of the mace and here largely because it's got all these little spikes and things and when it's monochrome those kind of disappear so that is the plan for today once these two guys are done i have a choice because if we look if we look over here Okay, those are the 9 out of 10 that I had painted over the last couple of weeks. Okay, you probably recognize those. And those are the remaining 6 of the set of 8 minifigs that were printed a week ago. Um, so when I'm done with these, I can either start another set of those. Or the other thing I can do is that... Yes, you can just put up my, you can put up my character's face and just say that's the grumpy mode. But we definitely need one because there's especially, you know, driving in the snow day. Driving in the snow day deserves a grumpy mode. And maybe just to do it because you just feel like, you know, I got a twinge in my elbow. And whenever I do this, it hurts. And the only thing I, advice I get is, well, if it hurts when you do that, don't do that. Right? That's not helpful. Um, mm -hmm. So I I play a, an online game. You wouldn't be su surprised by that, I suppose, because, um, you know, having been around for a while, of course, I'm playing a game that has been around for a while, so I do play World of Warcraft. And that's just a confession, but there is there is in fact in world of warcraft a wand of grumpiness and i managed to get one and i keep it safely in my vault because you never know when you might need it people around here say that i don't need any magical assistance to be grumpy so there ah um okay so No, it doesn't make the entire vault grumpy. It just makes the slot that it's in in the vault grumpy. Okay. I mean, uh, it's a wand of grumpiness. So you have to use the wand in order to cast grumpy. So there's probably this little aura of grumpiness around it, but it doesn't extend very far until the wand is actually used. And I, I'm pretty sure it's directional because it's a wand, you know, you know, you're all familiar with that stuff. So. It's not like an AOE grumpiness, I think. It's like a single target grumpiness. But it's a good thing to have. Uh, yeah, so what I was saying before I got distracted by that 
the, the continuous discussion of grumpiness is that Nikki spent a good deal of time priming sewer tiles and there are like there's close to a hundred sewer tiles these are largely floor tiles there might be some walls the little wells where the sewer liquid blows through and those all need to be base coated and just i might just like tackle a tray or two of those looks like there's 20 on a tray yeah so that might be oh more than that it's like there's two dozen on a tray so maybe i'll tackle um 24 of those and use up a whole lot of uh light gray neutral gray paint but enough chatting i think i'm gonna i'm gonna get started here um by taking the buff paint which is the color i'll be using um so who when you when you commented about the weather were you asking for a flip or are you going to actually ask for a flip before we get too far along here there we go we'll get our triple flip in after i finish mixing the uh the paint So thanks, thanks to our viewers' uh, suggestions. There's been all sorts of improvements here. One is the magnify head magnifiers that I'll be putting on soon. And the other is we've got like a pack of these little ball bearings. That was a recommendation for the paint. And so I spent some time over the weekend um, in all of our uh, Tamiya paints, these that come in these bottles and they now have a little ball bearing to mix them up and all of the washes that I use, these washes, those now have and here are little ball bearings in them which will help with the, the mixing of the pigment, at least that's the point, right? Um, yeah, flipping, gotta flip things here. Fewer and fewer things laying on the work surface that haven't already been flipped. I'm just gonna, I've done one of these before, but why not? It, it's not gonna damage things too terribly much anyway. Just I'll, I'll flip this brush. There we go. Maybe someone will come back on later and ask for a flip again, and that's what they'll get. All right. Um, yeah, these, this isn't too bad. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. Um, work on this without the glasses at first. See how my eyes focus. So yeah, we uh, we all sprang forward. Those who had daylight savings time on Wednesday, uh, on Sunday. What am I saying? Good grief! Obviously, obviously, I have not adapted that well. I know when it is. But you know, does anybody really know what time it is? Actually, yes, a lot of people know what time it is. That song was just kind of silly. I guess it was trying to make some sort of point, but... As they were doing it, they... I mean, they, they had to show up at the studio, you know, to, to record it. And they had that studio, no doubt, was reserved for a particular time.
different kinds of time. There's like the the time of day, all sorts of times. There's solar times, sad. No, there's different time zones and all of that. But then there's also the timing of the music. You probably weren't talking about that, but nonetheless, I do imagine that as as they were recording that song. They knew very well what time it was. What does that say? Hmm. Stick license? I don't know. Sleeting your audience? into being unconcerned about time when they themselves were attending to the time. Mm -hmm. quite, a, quite a conundrum. And then they probably performed that song more than once. And no doubt each time they did, they knew what time it was, you know. Even though bands are notoriously late in getting started, they never start on time, right? It's always it's later than the announced starting time. Nonetheless, they had some sense of what time it was. So maybe they didn't know the accurate time, but they knew the time. So, I mean, other than giving some, someone something to babble about, about time, you know, or someone to spout off, you know, some sort of social gathering of some sort or other about the meaninglessness of, of keeping track of time and all of that. Yeah, see, that's the problem with using the brush kind of horizontally as it touches, but at least that's a very easy to fix spot. Um, yeah. That's, that's the Monday morning rambling about time. It's about time we did that. Maybe, maybe I should do one of these days, maybe I should just do like silent movie kind of stream. There we go. Thanks for letting me know. Can you see it now? Yep, relaxing painting and the most the most common issue is having the painting not on camera so that uh, you know maybe you're getting the relaxing part but you're not you're not getting the painting part. And it's really not fair because you know. Like if you, um, if you're a subscriber, yeah, thank you if you are, um, or even better yet, if you have gone to patreon.com slash dice and dungeons and become a patron, you have paid your money. And if you have paid your money, you want to get your money's worth, which is that you want to uh, see painting. Okay, well, I got a little bit on the gray here, a little bit on the brown. But otherwise, that's not too bad. The other leg here.
we have um so i guess this is becoming part of part of the tradition of relaxing painting with dyson dungeons is uh not we get pre precipitation but we get we get who complaining about having to drive in it I think we'll just make that part of the ongoing show. Might, we should just, maybe we should just change the opening credits. Yeah. Relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons. There's precipitation and who has to drive it. We could maybe do a, a theme song with those as lyrics. What do you think? have to move this whole thing over. <clears throat> I'm firmly behind the camera. Let's see. That might be okay. Yeah, so here we are painting. I'm painting. Even the title of the show is us talking about how the sequence of words can create ambiguity in meaning. This is relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons, so does that mean that the process of painting is relaxing? Does it mean you should be relaxing while I'm painting? we be saying maybe you know I mean we could change the words around to add some words you are relaxing while someone else is painting with Dyson Dungeons that would be clear it might not be the intent though so the the economy of words, we're just saying relaxing painting, leaves it open as to exactly to what is the relaxing referring. Hi, old Brogger. No, I'm doing okay. I mean, here it is, it's Monday. We all sprang forward. It's snowing. Who has to drive in the snow? What can be what can be better than that? Than having who have to whine about driving in the snow? Um, we had grumpy day on Friday, so today. Day, we're not supposed to grump that much. I mean, you can always have a little bit of grumping because every day is grumpy day to some extent. But it's not like the whole day is going to be devoted to grumping like it was on Friday. But yeah, how about you? You doing okay? Of course, I, you know, whenever I do this show, whenever I do this stream, there's precipitation. It's just what it, it is, what it is. It's how this works. So that the pants. Like the pants color. I don't know. Somehow, I think the paint just sort of ran there. But it went up on the quiver. And it went up on the quiver in a place where you never see it. But I, I will have to fix that later. And then there's an unevenness. Fixing that, I made it uneven in the other direction. 
So there's that. Um, we've got rain and wind. Yeah, we've got snow, but no wind. See, I decided that the lighter color was going to go way up to here. But it's become, as, as we're saying at the beginning of the stream for the last couple of weeks, is that um, it's become part of the tradition of relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons that there be precipitation on the day of the stream. And like something that just has to be part of the hand here. I wonder if that paint rubbed off, maybe. And so, of course, today it's it's snowing. It's very pretty snow this morning. I can say that because I'm down here uh, doing relaxing painting and not having to drive it. Morning commutes in the snow are always unpleasant because, I mean, not only are you dealing with the I am trying to not run off the road or slide, through an intersection or something, but you've got all sorts of other drivers out on the road who may or may not be attempting to do the same thing. But wind won't be damaging. This time of the year, though, you know, the trees, there aren't any leaves on the trees yet, so unless there's Unless the trees are really like covered with ice, in which case it's very bad, or a lot of snow, they seem to hold up to it pretty well. In the summer, when they're all when they've got leaves and the leaves catch the wind, you know, especially gusts that are shifting directions, you can see a branch go whipping in one direction, and then the wind. Is it red on there? Oh. Her left hand needs a lot of rehabilitation. Sometimes you can see it that the wind will catch it in one direction and whip it around in the other direction. The branch just snap right off, which is really, uh, yeah. Okay, well, that's that's how this is going to go. This is why we will be using every other color that we have used already. I want to do touch up. I just touch the top of the whatever that is, those horn like attachment things. So I've got this flesh color, I've got that, I've got dark brown. Um, colors on the quiver here where that paint ran a little further. So yeah, there's a good deal of, let's pull out all the colors again and do touching up. Is the way. But that's what uh, what keeps the stream going is as I'm attempting to do this with slightly shaky hands and you know limited skill set. We get, we get to watch the colors come back and be reused. So t t the lengthy process of touching up goes up.
but eventually, it has happened with all the mini pigs so far. Humanoid and animal and whatever. Eventually they get done. And then they get set aside and maybe they'll show up in our stream as friend or foe. Can't tell at this point because they're just, you know, not designed that I know of for any particular reason, any purpose. Some of them might be. They might have something in mind already for some of these when they were when they were first printed. Um, I'm not sure because we are just characters in the Dungeons and Dragons stream. We are not the DM y'all knowing godlike figure that determines our fate. And on a whim, whatever, um, make us like pretzel deprived. We could be in a place with no pretzels. Critters, nothing. DM can be like that. Yeah, you can't see anything other than the base because I'm painting around the edges here. Uh, yeah. But not being the DM. I don't know if we're going to see these in the stream or not. And if we do, what role they might play. That's not too bad. So there's a good deal of weird little touching up to do. Like here and here. on the base of the quiver with the different colors that have been used and get to that. So that buff is really kind of a bland color but with a little bit of uh, umber wash on it. It ends up looking pretty decent. But I wanted there to be a color contrast between the one part of the garment and the other without getting into the use of too terribly many colors. Okay, so put that there. You know, I checked the snack the the snack shelf yesterday. So I have to admit, you know, I watch I watch NASCAR racing. My brother and I have been watching races. We grew up in Milwaukee. And my dad used to take us to the races at the State Fair Park. And there were, you know, big cars, as, as they called them. The front engine, Dauphin Hauser's, Hauser Roasters. Just, anyway, we don't need to get into all of that. But so we grew up watching racing. And then... NASCAR came on television kind of routinely 20 years ago or something because we're on much like our fourth generation of drivers that we've been watching anyway yeah so looking for a crunchy and salty snack to crunch and crunch on during the race um went to the snack shelf and there were no pretzels none at all there's some questions about that pretzels are kind of a recurring theme or Dungeons and Dragons campaign. But those pretzels are not the dry, crunchy 
pretzels that you get out of a bag. Those are like what some people call German pretzels. The really big, soft pretzels. Those, us, we were to make them ourselves, which have Alexis and Nicole have made pretzels. Um, maybe that needs to be done, and maybe we need to. have them like during the stream as a live snack that is not even what's happening here is being uncertain about where the top of the sh top of the boot is and it looks like it's there But, you know, I could get, um, even though it wouldn't, wouldn't be authentic in the sense of being the same kinds of pretzels that are featured on the Dungeons and Dragons stream. Yeah. Maybe I could get some pretzels and I could crunch on them. There, I got, got it on the gray here too. Nice. Yet another reason to pull out the gray paint uh, is <laughs> thank you. Slap shop techniques. No, I have never done that. Um, to be honest, I am not a trained painter, as you can tell by watching what I do. I am still using the techniques I used when I was like 11 years old painting in my parents' basement. So I'm going to have to look up even what a slap chop is. That will show my naivete about painting. So those of you who are watching this who think that this is a professional painting show, if by now you haven't figured it out, I am far from that. I am an old guy who likes to do relaxing painting on behalf of Dyson Dungeons. And you get to watch me, you know, spend like 10 times longer than most people. Oh, that's what slap chop is. Okay. I was not. You, 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 um, yeah, you had sent a link to that, the, the video of the very, very f quickly painted Yeti. Um, I didn't know that was called slap chop. I'm hoping that the cartoonish look actually is okay. I really, I like doing it this way. I know that it's not, it's not typical of how these things are usually painted, where there's a lot more dry brushing and washing and things. give it a different look but that's this is actually you know when in the day when I painted Warhammer figures when they first came out the orcs and goblins set I did orcs and goblins and all of my orcs and goblins were very clean um, you know we just got a set that I'm not sure we even opened yet, and I haven't tried them of um, the speed paint. I'm not sure where they went. 
but there is a, a set that we bought relatively I mean we didn't buy the most expensive because we weren't sure how it would work because um, we hadn't used it before but we do have some and have to give it a try I have to put my uh, head magnifiers on because I am not focusing on the details here very well. So here I go. My head's getting big. I just see. On this side, it's really clear where once where the sleeve ends, where this shirt goes up underneath the other one. Yeah, I probably should have had these on all along because uh, now, now I can see all the things that looked okay without them and now don't look okay with them. So we're going to have to try those speed paints. Maybe get, maybe get some... Um, Figures that we're not Yeah, I'm making trying to adjust my head and everything else. Yeah. We can get some get some practice figures. Figures that we know are definitely if we get messed up that we're okay with just starting over with a new primer and going at it that way. This is, this is weird looking at it with these. It looks very different than it did before. Trying to decide the top of the boots here. So that, you know, multi-step process like that. So they go black and then you put this paint on top of them. So they're almost, they're almost like a glaze instead of, uh, an opaque paint. That's why the undercoating, the priming is so important. That makes a lot of sense now. And that, that under explains too. I look, you know, you look at the video like yours or someone else who is using them and they look pretty opaque. The colors are pretty clear. And they separate. That's because of the base coat underneath them. Right. So if you want, um, if you want the contrast to work pretty well, that's why why they're black painted. So is the white highlighting. You know, how important is that to the dry brush white highlighting in the scheme of things? Got some white paints of various and sundry kinds, so that's something we can definitely do. 
or at least Nikki can. She's pretty good at dry brushing. I am. Well, sometimes I can do C work with dry brushing. I very rarely get better than that. But I can see why the the underlying color is a really critical part of that. Anyway, we've got these things, these speed paints, what, a couple of weeks ago, I think they arrived. Usually, I'm not, not the quickest to try new things. Even when I was younger, I didn't particularly do that. Um, and, you know, it's not a surprise that as you get older, it's like, I've done it this way for the last 50 years. Why should I change now? Right? I do have a little bit of that tendency, so I'm not the first one uh, to break them up. Hmm. Well, I bet the metallics are really good. It's one thing I did back in the day of paintings. More hammer miniatures. There we go. I knew that would have to happen. That it was really necessary to uh, always bump something with the back of the brush and there's always paint on it. And then it always gets on things. Um, yeah, so when I was doing these Warhammer miniatures, I was very proud of the effect of I... We didn't have the speed paints then, um, but I painted a dragon in silver and gold. And then you use the inks, the washes, uh, to overcolor it. So greens, and at that point, I think we even had a red one. Um, having colored metallic paints at the time. I just did it that way. And that, that came out, I think, pretty cool. So I bet as an undercoat, if that was showing through, the metallics would be really nice. Paint. Did I just get that just right, or did I just paint it too far? Sure, see how the rest of this goes. But I know that uh, especially Nikki and Alexis were really kind of interested in uh, trying the speed paints. So maybe I'll let them do that and see how that goes. Save the worst one for last. This is kind of, for me at least, a classic example of well, can't get there from here. Making a mess of everything. Ah. Got it on the buckle. Yeah, one of those. Um, if you see it, you should be able to paint it, but uh, not necessarily true situations. So we got some. We got some major reconstruction that has to go on there.
thanks for joining in. I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks for the tips. Those have been very helpful. But thanks again for joining. Have a decent day. wondering, you know, how am I going to be sure that I'm going to be filling the time on this today because I only had one other than the base color for the base, literally the base, and I only had one base color to put on. Take up time before the break. I wasn't sure. But then, as I was doing this, I answered my own question pretty quickly by getting um, this buff paint on all sorts of places I didn't particularly want it. Like the places where it shouldn't have gone. Lovely. Um, yeah, so I've got this whole belt here that needs to be redone. I need to even touch up the buckle, which is too bad. I'll probably do that first because I, I have to do gray paint touch up in many places. Anyway, um, but I wasn't planning on there. around there where the bottom of his sleeve is turned up detail this is really pretty fine and some skill of painter is not quite as funny. Well, at least I didn't splat all over its face. I didn't do that. All right, so enough of the buff. And you want an indecent day? You know who, you know what I'm thinking kind of day you should have? Try to guess the word that describes that day. Maybe you're already having that. You have to drive in the snow. No, you might be having that kind of day already. Um, okay, so looking at this, I have to decide. Which color, oh mess first I guess I'm gonna do the light gray uh, the light gray is the one that's in areas that should have dried by now start with that there is like the tip of one of the little bags the back of the quiver Get a little ball bearing clattering around inside the jar. It's just a light gray. This is the gray I used kind of sparingly. There's not too much of it. It's uh, basically the bags in the quiver. So it's like here. But 
is when you look at it though, even though it isn't necessarily the point. This paint just comes, it's much lighter when it goes on. It's dark. Um, yeah, right here, the tip, tip of the bag. there but you can't see it unless you you know turn the character over be darn it because the light from above, hitting that little bit. Hmm. Pretty. I want to check since I've got this paint out if there's anything else that needs touching up in the way of the light gray. Good. But to use the gray wash, it hardly, has hardly any color to it. To, to put on the bags and the quiver. I'm not sure. I thought what we need with this. Now I have to wait on the metallic a little bit because it touches this great paint. Um, got this on a hand, if I recall correctly. One hand that looked like it was not quite painted, I'm trying to remember. Was it on her? Yeah. Yep, there's red paint back here. And then there's uh, this part up here that looks like it's just not painted at all. So, I guess I'll squeeze out a drop here. needs to be painted. We need a little, oh, okay, as I'm looking at it, there's a spot there that needs to be that buff color. So I'm just going to take care of that right away. Immediately. 
or else I will miss it and forget it. That's where the I didn't paint the sleeve down quite far enough on the back of the arm here. Touching up is just little dots here and there. Even though it was very, you know, trying to be pretty complete and accurate, and I did look all around it before I put the buff paint away. You can edit again. I'm seeing to do a little more color. Okay, so let's do the dark brown. Um, this one this one goes on this is one of those that goes on pretty light and then gets dark as it dries Remembering exactly where all the spots were that needed a touch-up, I'll just go around the entire thing. misbehaving spots. Mm -hmm. it looks okay. This one is one of those spots. So, Opportunity to, to modify the boundary areas. A little bit here. Okay. That brush hit something it wasn't supposed to, unless I was moving it toward the model. Yes, right there, a little bit. Looks like it mainly hit what was already dark brown. Get a little bit, just a touch of that buff paint back out again. There was something on the red, too. I'll have to look again. There's a spot on the red somewhere. The crossbow red.
clutch this up and then I'm going to try to find the spot of the crossbow red that got hit. Yeah, it's almost time for a stretch. Remember, yeah, there it is. Tiny little spot underneath the buck the crossbow there. This is so tiny, I'm gonna try to uh, just get some. I've tried this before, sometimes it works. Let's get a bit of paint out of the bottle cap, the nozzle. And sometimes it doesn't work. You squeeze out like a hundred times more paint than you need, but it's still just a dot. Um, we need anything else painted red? Hmm? So I've got lots of red paint, and that's all I needed. All right. Um, get out the gunmetal color. We'll just do the same thing here. Give it a little stir. If I can succeed this time, I need this in two spots. One is on the belt buckle on the other figure, and the other is down here where I repainted the gray at the bottom of the quiver. Let's see if we can get the tiny dot out. This is our Pella today. Dots. And this one, down to here, is where I got that big blob of brown paint. Then I repainted the gray, and then doing that, painted back over. This little bit of. ever see unless the figure is like knocked over because it has been knocked out in a non-lethal fashion. And then, and the other one, this is where it got all over the belt. It's the buckle here. color is the dark gray. There's a lot of dark gray touch-up all over the place on the belts. For some reason, I did those first. Uh, for some reason, there was a reason, and that is because they're kind of a raised surface, and I thought I could paint up to them. And I did, but I also painted over them. So I'm going to let some of this set for just a bit. Take these off for just a bit. We're doing lots of little bits here. Two. 
Yes, yeah, Sofali, you were late for way late for the flip, you know. It's like an hour into it already. But you're lucky because I'm doing a scratch Ugh. and an eye rub. And uh, oh, it's Monday morning and it's snowing, and it's a very pretty snow, but it's still snowing. Um, and I've got one more touch up color to do before I do the wash on these guys. Uh, I'm going to start with a, a little bit of black wash on the head of the mace and the arrowhead. And then I'm going to do, I think, I think an umber wash, really light umber wash on all the brown bits to try to emphasize the folds of the fabric. But I think it was a, a compliment if you look up in the in the chat that my figures are clean and cartoonish. And I guess they are clean. You know, a lot of some people when they do their figures, they're just oh they just washed all over the place and made to look dark, but I don't know. I kind of like, kind of like the figures where the where the colors basically show through, and the wash is used just to uh, lightly to bring out like the folds and the fabrics and some of the details and contours and things. All my works and goblins looked clean. So I guess that's that's my uh, my idiom. That will, that will be my. You can tell my figures because they're like that. Okay, so I flipped this before, and I will flip it again. I do three flips there, and then a rotational flip. Whoa, yeah, yeah. Straighten out my back, and I'm going to talk a little bit as I'm waiting for this to dry. Before I do the last touch up, um, Dyson Dungeons, wonderful group of people, do uh, Dungeons and Dragons stream on Sundays from two until it's over. It's a wonderful campaign. It's been going on for over a year now, so it's got great continuity. Uh, I've got all sorts of inside jokes that you're going to have to go back and look at multiple episodes on YouTube in order to figure out. Um, we have recurring themes, we have pretzels, we have other, other kind of food, we have uh, getting underpaid for our work compared to the Saltworthy, we have rivalries, uh, we have friends. Alexis put together a very complicated and engaging world in which we play, so that's how we started, and in... The process of doing that, got a 3D printer, started printing some set pieces, started painting them, started figuring out how to paint on our own, started watching painting shows, decided that um, I don't have the skill to do a whole lot of that stuff, so um, I do what I do on the relaxing painting. And then uh, since we were painting dungeon tiles for the show, it was kind of, well, why don't we stream that too? And that's how this started. And that's why we have relaxing painting on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 10 until 2 with an occasional break or an occasional substitution. Uh, and that's what I'm doing today is working on some minifigures. The other thing besides dungeon tiles and minifigs is we now have at least one, two will be starting this week, Submarine Wednesday. Uh, I've given per, been given permission to work on uh, military models and things like that. So I first of all completed a Fink Eliminator and Ed Big Daddy Roth a model from the 1960s and 70s that I had started uh, something like 20 years ago and put away in a box 
and so brought back out and finished that. Eh, you know, people didn't like that too much. It's a little weird, but I liked it because that reminded me of being a kid. But then I have all of these models that I thought I would be building and painting when I retired that I didn't get around to. And I've been given permission to start on them. And the first one I'm building is a Renwall submarine, the kind where the side of the submarine hinges and folds down. And you can see the sort of detail on the inside. So I got a couple of the original Renwall George Washington Polaris missile firing submarine models and um, picking through it, finding the pieces and trying to do it in a lot better fashion than I did when I was in seventh grade, which I think is when I probably did the original. Um, yeah, so I started working on that. I, I did a box opening. I went through the three, three models that I bought trying to see what pieces I had to work with. One of the models seems to be pretty complete, but a little bit broken. So I've been working off of that one. And I'll be painting some of the interior on this Wednesday. The torpedo room and the sail, those are the first two, followed by the dining room. So we'll see how that goes. <clears throat> but uh, Submarine Wednesdays, until I'm told that Submarine Wednesdays, nobody wants to watch it. If you want to watch it, that's great, and I'll continue it. If not, let us know, and I'll go back to painting dungeon tiles and minifigs. But anyway, yeah, Submarine Wednesday Act 2 starts the next stream this week. Also, to let you know, I am going to be away for a few days next week. Looks like I'll be gone Mondays, Monday and Wednesday, so I am not sure uh, whether we're going to just not stream on those days because I'm gone, or whether possibly uh, Nikki or Alexis might come on and work on some of the things they were going to be working on. So, for example, there is this beholder that was printed right here on our very own rosin printer that Nicole said she will be painting because I am not willing to take this on. This is just too big and detailed and amazingly complicated. Um, I don't know. This might be one of those things where the the uh, speed paints that we got might be... She might try it on this. I don't know. But I'll let you know later this week whether we're going to be uh, taking off a couple of days when I'm not here or whether someone else might be coming on at least, you know, for part of it to keep the stream going on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 10 and two. So that's the news. And now it's time to resume touching up. Um, and I'll be touching up this dark gray color and putting little dots of paint all over the place and muttering about it as I do. So when I'm done with this color, I will be doing a little bit of washing. I'm going to start with some dark gray wash on the arrow point and the head of the mace. Not very much, just a little bit to dim it down, dim down the brightness a little bit. And also to highlight all the textures on the head of the mace. And then A little bit on the boots as well, it, just to, well, looks like it, the back of that boot needs to be touched up, but that's the color I'm doing next. Um, I do the boots as well, probably not the belt. I don't want to just mess things up, um, but, but the boots maybe just to give it a little bit of extra weight and to highlight the folds in the boots. Um, I 
And then I'm going to do a brown wash or an umber wash. I have to decide which. On the brown parts, again, just really light. I don't want to muddy them up as much as I want to just get... Um, Get rid of some of the monochronicity and show some of the folds in the fabrics. So, start by trying to adjust these so that I can focus. Better to find the top of this boot. Okay. Every time I put these on, I have to basically start over. Get used to them to try to get the angle and the distance correct. I've been smashing my brush into the bottom of this which does not bode well for the rest because I don't want to be taking a paint laden brush and banging it into places that are not that color. Right? Helpful thing. You're on camera? Yeah, more or less. That's pretty good. Try to get this fixed. The inside of the arm, I managed to get paint very badly slopped all over the place. Okay, that looks acceptable. And then we have a hole. I don't know how this happened, but this got way painted over. Let you know now that there's a slight chance we might and I might end up um, ending a little bit early today. There's um, we have an appliance that needs repair, and you all know how that goes sometime between one and five you know you get this very precise window so that you can plan your day around it right that's how that works so sometime between one and five there will be an individual showing up hopefully with the ability to repair the appliance and if it's after two that won't be an issue because that's when this will be over. But if it's at one, which is unlikely, but possible, abilities. If it's one, then I'll be wrapping up early because that's the thing that needs to be fixed.
It's still a little bit of issue here with the thing on the belt. Yeah, let's turn it around. This belt definitely should. The, the raised surface disappears. So I'm just going to follow the line along. And that is where that belt will be. I'm still torn about whether this is this color, okay. Whether to put a wash on the quiver. It looks it looks like it needs something. That that gray is a nice color, but it's pretty monochromatic. So I think I have some gray wash that has very little pigment in it. I might use it on the pouches and the quiver just to see if it makes it look a little less like brand new, a little less like it just came out of the shop this morning, you know? Okay, let's check this one out. You know, do the same. I'm going to use uh, the dark gray wool. When I do the wash on that, I'm going to put a little on the boots. It's a real bad combination of This area, read it long time. I like the ones that are so that you know you can't miss them, they're right there because it's usually an easy to reach spot as well. Okay, I think that's that's good. Give this a dip in the alcohol. 
just because paint seems to be blobbing up a little bit on the tip. Not on the tip, but around the metal part that I'm sure it has a name. Okay. Um, yeah. So now it's time to put the wash on it. And fortunately, so far, every time I've done that, I haven't ruined them, at least with the ones I've done so far. As I said, like twice in a row, right? So far, so far, so far. Um, let's start with the light gray wash. This is the one I'm going to use on the light gray things, the pouches and the quiver. These washes tend to settle. The pigment settles out of them really fast. giving it a good shaking. And this, you shouldn't really be able to see the color of this very much. It should pretty, I'm going to use a slightly larger brush. Um, but what I'm hoping is that what happens is it just Provides the slightest little bit of highlighting the, like the clasp on the pouch. Okay. But if I take a little bit of this and put it on there, I'll just be able to see those details just a little bit better. Quiver. I think that it um, reduces the pressure from the store look, and we'll see. Just sort of blot it on there. I want it to look, a, it's a very flat surface. So I want this to do is just to look a little uneven. I did want to use the really dark wash on this because I don't want it. Didn't want it to turn dark. So that's that's it. I mean, that's all I'm doing to it. I'll do the same thing to this one. Try to get it to sort of puddle up around the clasp on the bag. Anything here, I'm just kind of brushing it on and blotting it a little bit to give it see how it looks when it dries. There's a tiny bit of pigment in this, but it's kind of the same color as the underlying one. And again, I not I put a little on the arrows just because there's some feathers. Yeah, I mean, it'll just sort of gather in the... Um, feathers in the feathers. It's 
see. Let's see if it does anything to the quiver or not. Did them both, so I don't have a before and after. I won't be able to tell. Okay, well, that's enough of that. Then I'm going to take the dark gray. And this is going on the boots and the head of the mace. So I'm going to need like that, just this tiniest little drop. And I don't want a lot of it on the brush. I'm going to turn it in the arrowhead. I'm going to start with the arrowhead because that seems to be safe. Yeah. Very much of it. I just want that to not be such a bright silver color. And then what I want to do here is kind of get it into the um, ovens and folds and stuff. You can see all the spikiness of the mace head. Keep the, the color contrast the same. And I said I was going to touch it onto the boots. Pretty lifeless. A little strapping. Yeah, I mean, that's okay. And we'll do the same to this guy. because I don't have much to say about this. So I don't I don't want to, you know, I should get it on. The, I'm just not going to. I just don't want to mess it up more than, than necessary, right? That's That was 
that was just the necessary messing up. And then um, I'm going to use the umber wash. It's a little bit redder, tiniest little bit redder than the brown wash. And that's going to get washed all over the browns, both the light and the dark brown. Little bottle here. Yeah, so I get these big puddles of wash that are totally unnecessary for the task. And now we need a bigger drop because I'm covering more surface, so I'll probably just get a little drop, All right? There we go. Can always make more. Um, I'm going to start with this one because it's the first one I picked up. And I'm going to be starting down here because I want to get a feel. Painting a little bit across the grain because what I'm trying to do is get it kind of unevenly into the folds. Start down here at the easy spot stuff, right? I could just put that, no, I'm not going to though. I was thinking I could put it onto the straps as well, but. Do a little, little more down here. Kind of stripe it. I don't think I did this side. That might be why it looks so different. I turned the buff a nice color. I came out on there. Too much dark, a darker color. I think enough. So if we did a before and after with the other model, you'd be able to see it.
if we compare the two, you can see, you know, this it's subtle, but it's effective. We're going to back here. It's kind of in the shadow, so we want that to show. So despite putting this on, this is going to still be, this old, old Brogger says, it looks so clean. Yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be just how these are. Going to be cleanish. Yeah, getting quiet here. Sorry about that. I know that you miss you miss hearing me talk about stuff. So just apologize that I was just putting this on and you know, trying to get it to look okay. More up here, there's The streakiness in the in the back here. Maybe a little more streakiness up in the front. It's kind of what I want. Doesn't change the color too much, and if I miss a spot or get a little uneven, it's not not too awful. Okay, so what we need to do, what I need to do next, is uh, pretty simple. Is I'm going to get out a brown paint and paint the bases. Um, plot. Okay, so I'm going to probably run until like quarter after 12 or something before this is done. Um, 
and then I'll take a break. And when I come back, I'm going to be base coating sewer tiles. So I was given the choice of either starting another set of minis or working on the sewer tiles. But Wednesday is Summering Wednesday. And then Friday and then next week I'll be gone Monday and Wednesday. So I think since there are like a hundred of these things there that they're going to have to get done. So I might as well get started on doing them. This anymore. This is custom. Put these guys on here so that I can paint around the edges. These for this. Yeah. So this will take. This will take probably. You know, I'm going to paint one, and then the other, and then come back. And while it's still kind of damp, I'll be putting some brown wash on it again, just to um, give a little bit of texture and to make it look a little less. Wow, that didn't get. Despite the time it's spent on the mixer, when you see when you see stripes in the paint instead of a uniform color, you know it needs to go a little longer. So yeah, starting my break a little bit later, and then come back. And during the break, I will move all of this stuff somewhere else and bring out an endless stream of sewer tiles and a couple bottles of neutral gray paint. Now, let's see. I'll look this out here. I'm going to be holding it like this. It's gotten a bigger brush. Well, let me paint around the feet on both of these with this brush, and then I'm gonna get a bigger one. And because there's just a lot of featureless surface area here on these bases. And you are watching, or listening to, or YouTubing, or in some fashion engaging with relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons. We appreciate your support. Um, become a follower, become a subscriber. Be a real help if you like to. Um, going to patreon.com slash Dyson Dungeons and becoming a patron. As a patron, you get access to the ability to influence to some extent at a higher level our Dice, our Dungeons and Dragons campaign, and at an entry level, access to our um, warm up sessions, which are usually entertainingly silly. We enjoy doing them because, you know, totally off the rails, almost always. 
to set some sort of scenario for them. And then what we do usually has nothing at all to do with that because something happens, you know. Expect during the improvs. I'm just putting some brown paint on the base here, and then I'll do the other one. And as it starts to dry, I'm just going to splot some brown wash on it um, just to give it a little, tiny little bit of texture so that the base isn't completely monochrome. Then I'm going to take a break, and after break, I'm going to come back and start base coating sewer tiles. So all the tiles that we've done, the, the wooden ones are by far the prettiest, the wooden stucco. Those are really nice looking. Um, and the stone dungeon tiles sets at least have really interesting accessories like sarcophagi and cauldrons and sigils and things like that, um, trap tiles with flames and gas clouds. So that's pretty cool stuff. But my favorites are the sewer tiles. Not that I particularly enjoy as a D&D &D character splushing through sewers. Nothing good ever happens in a sewer. It's not the most pleasant environment. But I really like the way the sewer tiles came out. Um, Nicole came up with a, you know, as we mass produced them, kind of, a, a series of washes on them. And then we dribble either realistic water or epoxy down the center of the sewer. So it looks like stuff is flowing through it, like it's wet. So we've got moss and, and slime and some sort of unidentifiable sewer liquid and stuff. But I, when you put them together, they look really cool. So I'm hoping that this massive set or sets, I'm not sure quite what the design is. I haven't been involved in it other than to watch it being put together and then starting to base coat them. Anyway, once they're done, they're really they're really pretty cool. Maybe we'll at some point um, pull out some that were finished a while ago, just to show you all what it's aiming for. So there's that. I'm just going to use the same brush since it's here and it's brown. Hmm. I mentioned earlier, and I will mention again, these brushes just... I'm not getting them clean. I'm not sure what's up. Um, is we might, I might be ending early today. Put these back on camera. Because we have some essential appliance repair happening. And sometime between 1 and 5, because that's the precision of the window you get when you're trying to get repairs. And so if it is 1 then I'll be ending early to take care of that. If it is five, well, it is much later. If it's after two, there won't be an issue. But if it's before two, then with relatively short notice, I'll be um, ending the stream. 
Okay, so this, you've seen this before. I just blot this all over the place to... Uh, tone down the flatness or tone up the flatness of the surface. I leave lots of it all over the place, hoping that it dries and leaves some unevenness in the color. And it kind of works. I mean, the, this is, I'm just painting the bases of all of these figures the same. You're not really a set, so to speak, but this is this has become the standard for the bases for these eight seventeen mini figs that I'm painting. Pinch this and attempt to clean this brush. be taken a break. Checking to see how the snow is falling. Okay. Here and I will show you what they look like. These guys are clean. That seems to be the thing. Yeah. So this is our pair of mace wielding archers and i'm just not going to mess with them much more than that could put a little more wash on the brown i guess but yeah I, i'm satisfied with how they look so what is this eight nine these are 11. numbers 10 and 11 out of 17. dry before I take them off the stands because I will be needing the stands when I do the floor tiles. But right now, I have another sip of coffee. Hey, thank you for watching so far. Hope you come back after the break. Oh, it's only five after. So I didn't go as long as I thought. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah. So please come back after the break, which will be about 1230 daylight Eastern time. Eastern daylight time. Yeah. EDT. Yeah. Break time. Um, we'll be back with relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons doing exciting base coating of sewer tiles. So basically you'll be seeing me using a larger brush, putting a whole lot of gray paint on flat surfaces. And I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that because, you know, and then 11 little mini figs. Yeah. Time to move, time to get back to putting large volumes of paint on flat surfaces. Hi, Flying Ryan. You joined just as break was starting. But I also th want to thank you for joining in the uh, stream of our D&D campaign on Sunday, yesterday. Uh, no, you don't have the worst timing. I. I have had worse timing. Thanks. Yeah, we th we think those episodes, there isn't a whole lot of necessarily, occasionally we get into a dungeon crawl. That was kind of fun, but sometimes we just, we go to a new place and have to explore it. And when we get there, um, well, some sometimes it, ah, look at that. I missed a spot. I had this, uh, this dark washout and i didn't do the arrowhead so you get to watch me do this relaxing arrowhead you didn't miss it completely there 
That was pretty exciting. Pretty relaxing, wasn't it? Yep. So these guys are pretty much done. Uh, they, they are done. Basically, they're just drying. And so this is the latest in the series. And what I'm going to be doing after break, please come back. Uh, be about 20 minutes or so. Please come back. I'm going to be spreading gray paint as a base coat on sewer tiles. All right. So we'll see you. And again, thanks for coming back and watching. And especially thanks for joining us on Sunday. So break time.
<laughs> break. Um, thank you for the resubscription. Um, and I hope people are still with us after that break. What I'm going to be doing now is putting a bunch of gray paint on a bunch of floor tiles. These are, these look like our cut stone floors. And in fact, they're very much the same. These are also the floors to the sewers. And so these get base coated in gray and then washed with green to look like it's covered with moldy slime. And then the tiles, that are, I'll show you one of them. The sewer part of the tile. This is where the guck flows. Um, green paint, green wash, black wash to show that it's really scuzzy and slimy in the center. And then I put a little dribble of realistic water or clear epoxy down the center to show a rivulet of liquid flowing through it. And that's how we do our sewer tiles. And at some point, as I mentioned, maybe I'll pull an old one out and show it to you because I think they came out really pretty nice considering that uh, we were just pretty rookies at this. Um, yeah, so I've got some gray paint here. I've got a almost empty bottle that I'll be scraping the last little bits out of and then a new one because I'm sure that I'll be going through a lot of it. Um, there are six trays of two dozen each. So there are 12 dozen. There are gross we have a gross of sewer tile floors. This is going to take a while. We might end up doing some base coating off stream just to get through it, or else you'll be watching base coating for a very long time. This is uh, probably really boring for you folks, but for me, this is about as relaxing as the relaxing painting gets because I don't have to, I can keep my glasses on even because I don't have to really see up close. I'm putting this on because um, even though I put these on a holder like this to uh, hold them while I'm painting it, I still have to take them off. And then, yeah, that's inevitably why there's a touch-up. No, I didn't see that yet. Um, I'll have to take a look. I have not done anything other than watch the NASCAR race and eat dinner and stream today. I bet they're pretty nice. So I'll have to take a look, Walt Brogger. Um Yeah. Uh, probably no comparison. I know, I mean, you're a pro and we're not, but I think our sewer tiles are okay. But I will take a look. Thanks for mentioning that. Now I'm just going to just put gray paint on here. Yeah. And while I'm doing that, let you know that it stopped, it stopped uh, snowing. That means that we got to get now get to go out and remove the snow from the surfaces of the driveway and the sidewalks. Winter is hanging on a long time here. You're not a pro. <laughs> yeah, but you you know what you're doing and that's good. I'm I keep learning what I'm doing as I do it. You know, when I was when I was a kid and I first started building models, I didn't even know there were such things as books about how to build models. You know, it was like my dad came along and said, "Here, 
here's a plastic model of an airplane. Why didn't you build it? And so that's what I did. There was no painting involved. There was just spreading testers tube cement, which is what we had at the time. Very sticky stuff. Just spreading testers tube cement, spider webs all over the place. And um, coming up with the thing that looked more or less like an airplane than putting the decals on. But, you know, they were molded in authentic gray, silvery aluminum. It was just gray. It was light gray, but it was supposed to represent the aluminum. So no painting needed. So I learned how to get, um, well, that was quick. Yeah. I learned how to get tube cement all over my fingers. Um, I'm, I'm, um, uh, I'm way past 48. I am 71 and three quarters. That's, uh, I'm a little bit older than almost everybody at this point it seems like so yeah my when i was doing this paint not painting plastic models you know we had oh all sorts of them we had the Lindbergh line we had aurora we had revel revel depending on how one wants to say that <laughs> i am a i am a pro at uh staying alive I guess you could say that. I am, don't, at some point, levels stop, don't they? I mean, in most games, like, the top level is often maybe around 60. And then after that, can't level up anymore, and the rewards are different. In some games, you just get more of whatever the local currency is, gold or you know, what was it in the, in one of the games? Ru rubies, rupees? Yeah, the level cap is, no, not 20. I'm pretty sure it's 60. I've never seen a level cap go past that, though, that I can recall. Um... So that's about, that's about the, it, it must be that because that's about the time I stopped having birthdays is right around 60 is because um, I hadn't realized it at the time, but what I had done was I reached the level cap. Now that I put it that way, then it makes more sense. I thought I thought I was just being like either wishful thinking or grumpy or something about like I don't have birthdays anymore. But now I understand exactly what happened. Okay, well this moves along. As I pull these off, I know I'm messing up the corners. There's, there's no way around that, but there's always, no matter how much I try because of the texture of the surface, after the paint spreads on these, um, there's there's spots. Okay, I try to get it down into those little divots, but then there's always spots, and so there's a touch up. This is good. I thinned this paint. I put some thinner in this paint because it's almost gone. It's right down near at the bottom. Oh uh oh, yeah. You better catch the rabbit. And, uh, yeah, you're under 60, so you actually have a chance of doing that. See you in a bit. We have a rabbit. I think our rabbit in rabbit years is somewhere around 90. I mean, the, the human equivalent of, of rabbit years. 
um, he's really very old, but still quite lively and um, freak and, and likes treats. We have these little biscuits, rabbit biscuits that actually are very herbally. They smell delicious. They really do. Um, it's almost tempting to use them for a soup stock, I've said, because they they just have a, an aroma like that. Anyway, a really ancient rabbit still, when I come down, will greet me by hopping up and down and looking hopeful. And of course, he then gets a biscuit. So I'm gonna I'm gonna attribute his longevity to his poor diet of um way too many rabbit treats. Yeah, there is something. I mean, they really are. I think it's the treats because they're supposed to get like one every two days. And I think, I think, uh, I think the rabbit gets two a day sometimes, maybe more because I'm not the only one who does the treats. But they're they're really pretty good. Well, yeah. So this is moving along. Nice flat surfaces, so that I you know I don't have to push the paint in too hard. Um, paint across. Just get it out of the divot there. A rabbit has at least never broken free. Sometimes when the cage is being cleaned, it's like, yeah, go enjoy yourself, run around the room. Uh, but it never scampers very far away, and it's usually pretty easily retrieved. So depending on whether the appliance repair person shows up, between one and two, which is less, not real likely, as opposed to later in the day, they're supposed to be here between one and five. You know, you always get these windows of sometime, probably in the afternoon, someone will probably show up to take a look at and tell you whether the thing can be fixed or not and how much it'll cost. Um, if they show up close between one and two, then I'll have to to end the stream early uh, to accommodate, you know, to deal with that. But if it's after two, then I'll just keep going, doing this until our normal closing time. But for me, this is this is definitely relaxing painting. I can sit up a little bit. I don't need head magnifiers. I don't have to worry about whether my hand is steady or not. Two, four, six, eight. This is, there's, I pulled 24 of them out. Each tray holds two, two dozen. So this is, Eight out of twenty-four, which is four twelfths, which is one third, which means that I'm thirty percent done already, and hardly any time has passed. So I'm probably going to be able to, you know, if I've got enough room to set these down, I'm going to get the base coat, which is good. These are these are really fast. Okay, the, there's a base coat, and then there's um, a green wash. The way we do them, and the green wash is supposed to be uneven because it's supposed to have like splots of, you know, there's some places where the green slime is thick, and some places where it's thin. This is right at. Definitely my skill level. I can do A work on these. I can spread gray paint on them. And I can I can do splotchy wash really well. It's almost like I have 
expert level splotchy wash skill. Um, but before putting the wash on, these will these will need a touch up because there's there's always something there's always spots that don't get quite covered, don't get covered well enough. The paint pulls away as it dries, and that leaves like a a little looks like a bubble head burst kind of thing. The, you know, try to get it in all the little divots on the on the surface. There's a lot of it's uneven. It's all pitted, kind of. Caught the rabbit without too much trouble. Sometimes animals like that, you know, what they're really good at doing is uh, like getting behind furniture. So if there's a sofa, for example, that's or like a wardrobe or something, a piece of furniture that's almost too heavy to move, or if you move it, you'll scratch the floor or tear the carpet or something. Okay, that's the kind of thing they look for. They say, ah. Oh, if I get behind here, no one will get to me because, you know, this is anthropomorphizing the, the little rabbit brains, but it's kind of like, this is, this is big and heavy. It looks safe. I'm climbing behind a rock maybe or whatever. So yeah, that could have happened. Um, is that the rabbit could have hidden behind an immovable object. And then what do you do? You know, can't it's you can't really move it, at least not alone or without causing damage to something. So you get out like treat pellets or a little piece of lettuce or vegetable or something and try to try to bribe the animal back out. I'm not sure what else you can do. <clears throat> anyway, I'm hoping that we'll hear back from Ryan. Find out how the rabbit saga has been going. I am trying to arrange these so that they're not touching each other, but they're also not taking up a lot of space because I'm going to be doing several dozen of these, assuming we have until two today. Pushing it down on the surface. Sometimes I remember and I kind of swirl the brush to get it down in the, the little pits on the surface, and sometimes I don't. And then we'll see how that turns out later when it comes time for touch up. And so as I'm painting this, I'm wondering maybe I shouldn't be doing these edges in this color because this is neutral gray. And that means it doesn't take sides. On the other hand, maybe it's okay because I'm painting all of the sides. Oh, good. And the rabbit, the rabbit is unharmed. We were speculating that maybe the rabbit had decided to hide behind some immovable piece of furniture, you know, something so heavy that you couldn't move it. And it just, and then it just sat there in the dark, you know, looking at you. And if rabbits could smile or laugh, that's what it was doing. But I've got you, I'm glad you got it back. We're talking about our rabbit. We have an ancient rabbit. That in people years is probably in his 90s. It is a very old rabbit, but it's still quite spry and is eating well, loves his little biscuit treats. 
doesn't hop around that much anymore, though. That's, I'm going to have to clear that off. There's, there's a little print in the corners of this one. There's some buildup of melted filament, and I'm going to actually do that right now. Otherwise, I'll forget about it. Um, the problem with that is that these fit pretty close together. Oh, it's not in the house. It's outside. I, yep, at least it responded to a treat. That's good. But being outside, you could have been gone for, for weeks. I mean, you could have been on an excursion forever. Now I'm tracking this rabbit down throughout the neighborhood. Of course, it went under a car because you couldn't. You then couldn't move the car without endangering the rabbit. Um, wow! Well, congratulations, son. Got you got it out. So our rabbit really likes treats too, and we'll have these little biscuit-like things that I was talking about. Well, this is good. I'm going to cut toward my thumb, right? I'm going to do a little more. I'm going to do some touching up right away on this. But these things fit closely together when they're, when they're magnetized on the base. And if there's this, you can't see it. I mean, it's not going to show because it's around the sides. But if I left that on there and it were finished that way, um, this particular floor piece would not not contact the other ones very well. So we'll just slap some more gray paint on here and try to, I know I'm going to have to do touch up on the corners anyway, where I touch it to take it off the holder. But I didn't need to do that much touch up. It dug underneath the tiles. Wow. That is one persistent, good digging rabbit. I mean, I can understand figuring out how to dig under a fence. You still as a rabbit, even though if you can squeeze through something fairly small, you have to dig a pretty good hole. But if you have to, if you're doing like a the great escape kind of tunneling, through con under concrete barriers, you are one persistent bunny. At least it keeps its claws short. I bet our rabbit has a tendency for the for the claws to just grow huge because there isn't anything to claw at. I mean, it can kind of claw at. The, there's some carpeting. It's an indoor rabbit. And there's some indoor outdoor carpeting underneath the you know the sort of around the cage, but that isn't enough to keep its claws. In fact, I think you know as it's gotten older, it just it has sort of stopped the digging behavior altogether. Maybe it's got a little you know arthritis or something in its fingers. I don't know. You know, I mean, you've seen pictures of rabbit warrens, right? They dig out a whole hillside. They'll, like, dig 10 feet into the side of a hill and down into it. So, yeah, I mean, if they're digging under two inch, if they're digging a foot or more and creating a tunnel, digging a tunnel underneath those tiles, you get one persistent tunnel digger. So, yeah, you'd have to dig down like two feet. Even if you dug down like two feet, like you, you put in a two-by-two-foot concrete barrier all around it, I you'd, they, that rabbit probably would get out anyway, unless you kept checking all the time for tunnels. So you would. You'd have to be like constantly monitoring for tunneling behavior. 
put like little, little microphones in the ground around it, you know, so that you could pick up the sounds of tunneling and building. And if you put maybe two or three microphones in, then you could tri triangulate the location of the tunneling behavior. And then you could pinpoint it because the rabbit is probably doing something like on The Great Escape, if you've ever seen that old movie, you know, tunneling out of a POW camp. Um, had to, had to sit, they had to hide the dirt, right? Because what do you do with all the dirt? See, your rabbit, your rabbit probably is like hiding the dirt by shoving it in a corner somewhere or spreading it around so that it doesn't show up. So yeah, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to put uh, sound sensors in and monitor for tunneling behavior so that you can locate the incipient tunnel and do something about it before they get out. But yeah, if they if they've escaped concrete barriers already, that's that's pretty impressive. What sort of treat did you end up using? Like a fresh vegetable or special small animal rabbit treats? Uh oh, sin pfeffer. Yeah, you know, I could never bring myself to eat rabbit because just, you know, but I guess they're pretty good. Uh, okay. So that was enough to bring it out of its hiding spot. Well, that's good because, you know, trying to climb, crawl around. Well, yeah. I mean, if you tried to crawl under the car, um, you know that what would happen is it would just tear off in the opposite direction and probably hide somewhere. That was even worse. So responding to candy and then, you know, letting you grab it, at least you had that. That's a persistent bunny. Well, we're almost down. We're almost down to using the brush to like scrape out the bottom of the bottle here. Which would give me an opportunity then to open a new fresh bottle. But I, I it really kind of worked because the consistency of the paint is really pretty good. I put some thinner in. You no, know, it's like anybody, right? Um, like us. The foods that we like best are the expensive ones. It's like given the opportunity, we'd eat a, you know, the, the premium whatever. You know, if you eat animals, it would be like a fillet or a ribeye or something, or center cut pork chops. Or it's always, yeah, the treats are the expensive part of things. So these an the animals know just as well as we do. Yeah. Was it in Jurassic Park? Is it heavy? If it's heavy, then it's expensive. With food, it's <laughs> yeah. Yep, see? It's like, like you said just in the line before, expensive, but he likes it.
that that correlation between cost and and whether it really tastes good or not. And then it and it's like, well, you, you might say, well, it's just, you know, market manipulation. If people like it, of course they're gonna charge more for it because they like it. But I'm not sure it's really that way. I think that um I think that it, in reality sometimes it's just that things that really taste good are are hard to come by. So they're expensive because of scarcity, not because of marketing. Not always, but but usually. Uh, let's see. So there's a little up here. And I followed your advice and I got, well, I didn't. They call it Alexis did. Got some of these little ball bearings to put into the paint to mix. And so, yeah. It really does make a difference putting a little thinner when you get down near the bottom and it's more pigment than um than solvent a little bit of thinner in and one of those little metal ball bearings up really well so it's flowing and covering probably as well as the paint from the next bottle I'm going to open in just a little bit because there isn't much more to pull out of this part. So when I grew up, it was, uh, you know, I still have this habit. It really annoys, annoys some of the family is don't use it up. You might not be able to get more, which wasn't a very helpful thing, you know, cut back on experimentation and stuff. But it's like, oh yeah, there's still a little paint in this bottle. Look, I think I can get one more brush full out of here. Just like that, right? There's just enough barely to cover one of the squares of the floor. But there it is. Now it's really dead. So I'm gonna get, I'm gonna salvage this little ball bearing. Dump it in the water, and hopefully not lose it down the uh, down the drain. But there, I'm even saving the little ball bearing and a brand new bottle of paint. No, <laughs> oh, of course. You know that's the kind of thing you with now the ability to cross borders either through trade or in this case where you where the border is close you almost need to, you need to do everything all together at once or it doesn't work mm -hmm. so you try to make your population healthier and all you do is you increase carbon dioxide emissions see that's not bad at all you know, if you really need sugar, if you really need sweets, you could drive there, eat a bunch, load up the boot of your car, and um, come back, and then sell it on the black market, probably, you know, making a whole bunch of money in the process, because that's, you know, uh, that's what happens, right? If you make something more expensive or illegal in one place, but it's not in another place nearby is you just end up having smuggling. Oh yeah, there's that. So you try to do, you try to do a beneficial thing, but unless, unless everybody does it at the same time, you end up with an arbitrage opportunity. I guess that's the word for buy low, sell high by crossing borders. And it's all the EU, right? So it's not like there's border controls. It's not like you'd be stopped at the border and have your this seat cushions taken out by the border police to make sure that you weren't illegally smuggling in um, some sort of sugar base, corn syrup base, something around there.
It's amazing how. Oh, well, ended up with an odd number at the end because. Yeah, so you, you get a whole lot of uh, long distance shopping, right? And you just increase carbon dioxide emissions in the process because people are driving, sometimes probably even renting a truck or something, right, to uh, cross the border and bring things back. Yeah, lower, oh, yeah, sales tax, like a, yeah, is that like a, a value added tax? The sales tax, we call it that here, uh, sales tax. I think in, in Britain, it's value added tax. In Canada, across our border, it's a VAT, value added, which sort of implies that the tax is adding value, right? Value added tax. Um, and I suppose in some respects it is in that, you know, it's whatever the tax dollars are spent on. Hopefully there's some value to that so that the tax is adding value. But what is it? Technically, I think that the tax is on the um, upcharge, the increase in price between one level of sales and another, like between wholesale and retail. So the value added tax is supposed to be on the amount that is the price is increased. They call it value added, but it's really price added. Whether you know, it's the same thing. Buy something wholesale and sell it retail. It's still exactly the same thing that it was when it was wholesale. So you haven't added any value to the product other than it's not in the warehouse anymore. Maybe it's somewhere closer to you. But um, yeah, the price has gone up and that, that's what's supposed to be taxed. But I think it's just a sales tax because it's just a flat percentage on like everything without calculating the difference in price. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So essentially they're they're doing um yeah. Aiding and abetting smuggling. It's kind of like a an isn't it like an international incident kind of thing? Where one country is explicitly going out of their way to harm the interest of a neighboring country. The wall is like an, an act of aggression. I guess the same thing happens here. There's some products that are taxed more heavily in one state than another. I think it was tobacco. Um, where Indiana, we we're in Michigan, and Indiana is just to the south of us. Indiana had a lower tax. And so people would drive to Indiana to buy cigarettes, probably spending like four times as much on gasoline doing that than they save, but it's the perception of things. Well, there, there is gray on a two dozen of flat tiles. Let me go stand up just a second and bring a bunch more back, another two dozen, and start putting gray paint on. Apologize for being off camera doing this, but I didn't know how many I'd get done how quickly. Um, so I only brought two dozen to start with. Do something a little different. I'm going to do um, a dozen of those flat floors, but then also a dozen of these sewer troughs. The rate this is going, 
assuming that these sewer troughs don't take too much more time and I can actually find a place to put them. We would still have a way to do that. Um, that should take me about two o'clock. So the appliance repair did not show up at one. So we are now wow, twenty five percent. That's pretty high. See, our sales tax runs six percent. You know, people, I think in Europe would just say, "You've got to be kidding." No, but that's it. It's like six percent. And it's on, it's not on most food. And then there's a few kind of medical products that aren't taxed either. Um, but yeah, every time anybody talks about raising the tax a little bit, you know, to maybe pay for some important part of infrastructure, you get a huge, huge hue and cry. Not, not quite the level of France. I have to say France is really good at getting upset about everything. Yeah, you know, they get half the country on strike and marching over something that we in the States would consider, you've got to be kidding. But, um, yeah, so 25% is, is, that's a lot. Especially, I can understand if you can go across the border and, you know, the electronics thing, yes, there is. <laughs> Britain is starting to catch up though. They've been, they've been doing a lot of striking lately. So, you know, they left the EU, so maybe they're just trying to show that they're just as good as countries in the EU by having almost as many strikes as France about something. But France is, France is really the best at it, I have to say. Wasn't there a time, I think, when Italy was pretty good at it, too? But that seems to have stopped. You don't see too much of that. But, yeah, I can see, especially, you know, if the difference between 25% and 0% on food products, that would, that would almost be, you know, if you could stock up on something, non-perishables, you can buy like a year's worth of stuff at once and store it somewhere um, in six months or so that it would, it would be worth taking, spending the money to go across the border for that. Is so, yeah. So, the thing in France, and this is you know, I'm just doing a comparison here, I'm not going to try to make any value judgment, but I'll just say that here in the states, we have this thing called social security, which you pay for every time everybody who has a you know, a regular job, there's a combined tax, yeah. That's true, the Scots did. This would be the second time they would talk about leaving. The first time, it's kind of funny, the first time the referendum failed because it meant that if they separated from Great Britain, then Scotland would not be in the EU, and they wanted to be in the EU. And so one might say that the referendum failed because Scotland wanted to stay in the EU, but then Great Britain as a whole left, and now it's the only way to get back into the EU is to leave Britain. I, I've heard that, uh, well, Sturgeon quit because she just, it just was not moving along because the rest of Britain didn't want to lose Scotland. Well, see, that's something. We have more or less free education up through 12th grade here. Some people will pay for private schools for a whole lot of reasons, ranging from there isn't any alternative to religious reasons to just out-and-out -out racism. Um, 
But then after that, no. Not paying taxes has a downside in that you don't have the things the taxes could pay for. But it's especially true about medical care, which in the United States is not seen as um, like a right or a social benefit, but it's just a business, like all any other business. In fact, a lot of there's just a lot of unabashedly for profit providers, all the drug companies are. But even hospitals and physicians' practices are unabashedly businesses. And business comes first, and the provision of health care is just the mechanism by which the business operates. But we pay, we have like, what have I read? I think something like, um, I know we're the highest among the larger economies in terms of the proportion of our gross domestic product goes to healthcare, I think by almost like a factor of two. And at the same time, you know, given that level of expense, we have a lot of people You actually get a stipend while you're going to school, so you don't end up with debts of fifty thousand dollars. It's just amazing how the difference in attitude, you know, where it's like education is a really good thing that should be supported for the benefit of society as a whole, as opposed to an opportunity to issue loans. But yeah, but we still, you know, the big rallying cry is cut taxes further. <laughs> right. I mean, you're just, you're getting a stipend to live on. So you don't exit school. In seven years, you can get a graduate degree, at least a master's, if, you know, if you work at it. Um, and you've actually had some of your living expenses covered, not, you know, you're not living rich on that, but it's certainly a help. Um, yeah, and you don't have $50,000 of debt when you finish your education. Shouldn't tell people that here in the states. They might decide that that would be something they should have here. It's a good good thing we remain ignorant about that. So yeah, I don't. I mean, here you could not. No matter what you cl said, you're going to do with the money. There's no way you could get away with taxes at that level and still be elected to office. This country, what we're ending up with is people starting to question whether a college education is even worth attempting because the amount of time it takes to pay back what you put in just demands so much of your income. But yeah, so back to France, and just this is just the difference here in terms of history and attitudes is that 
we pay, I think the combination between employer and employee, if you have a, a salaried or hourly work with uh, an employer, is around 14%. It's kind of split. Like the employee pays 7% of their gross wages and the employer puts in an equivalent amount. Um, and you can start claiming benefits, I think, around the age of 60, but they're greatly diminished. They're really cut back. Full benefits are now like 72. So in order to get your full Social Security benefit, regardless of how much you paid in, Oh, yeah, I'm sure that they were able to point out a large number of differences, and I'm guessing they're not planning to move back. But that's pretty cool. Um, making a move like that and then comparing and contrasting your experience. Yeah. So, yeah, so, I mean, when you think about it, the official retirement age now, in the U.S. in terms of getting full benefits. No, I, it's not 72. Duh, I'm sorry, it's 68. So it used to be 65. That was like retirement age was always 65 in the U.S. And now now in order to get full benefits, you have to wait till you're like 68. And I think it keeps climbing. And so when you look at a place like France where they're saying, oh, no, you can't increase it to 64, People here in the States, just you just have to shake your head and go, what are they thinking? I mean, people here in their 64 are just barely able to start thinking about maybe in the next five years, three to five years, they might be able to retire. And so the thought of public demonstrations and strikes in order to protect the right to gain a full pension, or the equivalent of a pension, at an age, at that young an age, is just amazing. Ah, yeah, so you look at the French and uh, just across the border there and go, yeah, what are you thinking? Yep. So hopefully, when you are 70, you are still healthy and active, which is easier to do when you've actually got good health care. Yep, so the same sort of thing that's going on. What do you, what do you all think of the French and their privileged status? Get into uh, do you get into the little international when because you're pretty cosmopolitan in Europe, you know, and people travel around a lot with the open borders and all. So I'm sure that you have a lot of opportunity to get together with people from France and other places. You know, do you get into like big bar fights or something about retirement age? Do you have the opportunity to do that? Okay, it just seemed like that would that would be a you know, a good way to pass your time in the in the taverns or pubs or clubs and things. I mean, it's a whole lot lot more fun to have like a little bit of an argument in a in a tavern about retirement age than it would be to have another war or something like that. That would be that's a real step up in civility. But it seems like there is certainly the opportunity to do that, given the differences, the vast differences from one country to the other.
Yep. So I'm guessing our pliancy pair is going to be closer to five than to one. I'm thinking what I'll do here today. Ah, okay. So either like across the channel or um, north. Well, of course, yeah, you, I mean, from what I know, the, the natural connections of Denmark would be with the Nordic countries, much more so than France or Spain. Just in terms of history and things, that makes a good deal of sense. Um, in the sense that to not do that would be nonsensical, but just that it's understandable that that would be the case. So the um, yeah, the situation in the Nordic countries, um, from what I understand, is pretty similar, isn't it? That there's fairly high tax rates of one form or another, but that um, there also there's like universal health care and educational benefits and things like that. I'm not sure that, that that's certainly not the case in the UK, I think. It's less and less all the time um, as their government cuts taxes and as a result cuts it back on what can be paid for with the taxes. So you end up with a national health service that everybody loves but is understaffed. <laughs> uh, yeah. So for all of all of the complaints about Vikings, you know, the pillaging and the plundering and the raising of cities and things of that sort, uh, they did leave a pretty decent heritage behind them of the of social benefit. Uh, I wonder if hmm. Okay, so I'll just speculate out loud. Because that seems to be part of the culture, you wonder if that was actually part of the Viking culture. That if there there was this sort of same sense of communal responsibility in in their cultures that they that they brought along with them and that still remains. Or whether it's just something something more contemporary. So here in this country, I would say that if you were to ask a question like that, it would, the, the way we would deal with that would be to spend endless hours uh, speculating, having a strong opinion one way or the other about whether that was the case or not, without ever doing any research to actually find out because that's that's just part of the entertainment of, um, of those kinds of issues so actually finding something out and settling the question is is not something that we we leap to as our first response It's to take sides and argue the issue. And you can't even say in ignorance, you know? I mean, it's not like we're ignorant. It's just that we're intentionally avoiding, intentionally avoiding evidence that would um, prove us wrong one way or the other. Oh, yeah. You just go look it up and try to prove your point. You can find anything to prove any point, any direction you want which is sort of true nowadays. But it is an interesting question um, because when you look at the current social benefits of the Nordic countries compared to everything else, well, they certainly would call them socialists, if not communists. You know, Nobody calls anybody a communist anymore, really. That's not... It's not the, the word that we use as a pejorative for one's social, um, social responsibility. It's socialist because 
you know, the Soviet Union collapsed and what have you got? Um, I mean, you know, these sort of communist countries like Vietnam and then there's China, which I think, you know, with Chinese characteristics. And so you can't use communism here because you have to use it with Chinese characteristics. So a socialist, but I think if they were that, they would, they would probably be, we'd probably be yelling about how socialist they were. And, and if we started doing that, if we started arguing about how socialist the Vikings were, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't, uh, we would change our opinion of them. It was like, oh, yeah, they were soft, cuddly people who took care of things and had health care as much as we had back in, uh, 1100 years ago, but, um, you know, so that might be, you know, it might be that they carried that part of their culture along with the pillaging and plundering. You got to, you know, you got to let loose somehow, right? Um, that, that was, that might, that might have carried on over all of the centuries, in millennia even, to explain kind of what was, what's happening in, in the Nordic countries. Because there's a kind of, you know, a different level of social responsibility on the part of government and the people than there is in other places, even within Europe. Okay. Well, but I can say for sure. Yeah, there always seems to be that, I call it the monkey island syndrome. And granted that it's really, how did that happen? Okay. And you get a finger on that major way. That no matter how, how egalitarian parts of society where there is always, always somebody else, either above or below. But then again, you know, not to make excuses. At that time, there probably wasn't any way of thinking about it other than slaves. It's just slaves had been around forever, you know, in, in every, any place that had recorded history, there was a slave class, usually made up of conquered people, because that's, there was a lot of conquering going on, right? Someone who was different, but there always seemed to be that class of laborers. We now call those machines and robots. That's another thing to wonder about. I mean, did, was it, was it even possible at that time to think about not having slaves, no matter how abhorrent we find it now? <laughs> like killing your slave and killing your uh, reindeer or, or cattle or sheep. But was there a time when it was, I mean, not that I think people liked being slaves, right? That wasn't a thing. That wasn't a thing that you'd aspire to. But was there a time when it, it, within a certain culture and in time, it was virtually impossible to conceive of not having slaves. And what did it take to make, to change that? All sorts of questions.
that we can ask here on relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons that, uh, you know, something to think about. Yeah, pull these off and get the corners messed up. But that's how it is. There was also a lot of death penalty stuff, wasn't there? That's another thing, was it just killing people for doing things that were considered to be a crime when you hear about it? I don't, I don't know if it was a lot more prevalent then or not, or whether it was just the way it's been recorded, but there, that seemed to be a thing. And it wasn't like there's a huge surplus of population during those ages either. You know, people were, kids were dying young and there's lots of disease and infections from injuries and stuff. 1807, well, you were ahead of us by 54 years. No, 50, 57 years. Um, but still, when you think about it, that's that seems really late, doesn't it? 1807 doesn't seem that long ago, or in our case, 1864, or for some, not until Juneteenth in 1865. So we can look back at that and go, how can this even be? How could this even have happened? You know? But from a perspective of maybe 2,000 years ago, it might have been impossible. Just like it's almost impossible to think about slavery now, it, there might have been a time when it was impossible to not think about it. it makes you kind of shiver a little bit, if that were the case. Well, this is the timing will work out pretty well. I'll be finishing my second dozen of floor tiles. There's four left. And I haven't even talked about decimals and fractions here as I'm working through dozens of these things. We could be talking about fractions of dozens. Yeah, let these dry. And of course, there's touch up where I pulled off the paint when I pulled these off the stands on the corners. And because they're pitted surfaces, um, there's probably all these little dots of paint like there always are. Just looking over them, though, it's not too bad. Other than the corners, little bits in the corners and some of the edges, this seems to be covering pretty well. So the, you know, the touch-up will still take time because you have to look at all the surfaces and rotate it and dab it with paint. Oh, well, have a good dinner. Um, yeah, maybe you can join us on Submarine Wednesday. That's what's coming up this week. You have a, you have a great day, too. Thanks for joining in. So I've got, uh, yeah, I'll be finishing these up right about two o'clock with Eastern Daylight Time, because we have done our sprung forward. We have sprung forward this last weekend. Everybody's jet lagged, of course even being retired and having flexibility of when I am awake or not. Nonetheless, this had to happen on time and did. I was on time this morning. It's a Monday after springing forward and I was able to start on time. I'm pretty, pretty pleased with that. Yeah, so after this, I've got two more to go, and that's what I will finish with. And then I'll do a recap and a look forward.
And it's just as well, I am just about out of space to set these down to dry without them all touching each other. So an interesting conversation, com comparing and contrasting cultures, including that in Denmark to that in the US. We had a chat about France and how they get to retire much earlier than people in the US or Denmark. And they want to keep it that way. Now, I have to say that being retired, I have a lot of sympathy for people who would like to be retired because, at least for me, and maybe for a lot of folks, being retired is a whole lot easier than not being retired. That, of course, depends on whether you are getting your uh, Social Security or government pension or whatever it is that you have in the place where you live. On the other hand, if you don't have those things at all, and I know a lot of the vast majority of people on the planet don't, then there's not much alternative but to just keep doing something in order to keep the resources flowing. Forty-eight out of forty-eight. Read a lot of gray paint on a lot of flat surfaces here today after break. So what is coming up is we have Submarine Wednesday on Wednesday. And that is where I will continue working on the 1960s vintage Renoir cutaway Polaris launching nuclear submarine model. I had successfully found, prepared, and over the weekend primed the pieces necessary to complete the torpedo room up front and the sail, which is the part where that holds the snorkels and radio antenna and periscopes and things. Um, that got primed, and so I'm going to start painting those in a whole lot more detail than the painting directions give. And the way I didn't paint them in detail when I built my first one back in what probably would have been 1964. I'm just guessing 60. Yeah, it would have been about the time that I would have done it. Um, so on Wednesday, we return to that. So far, the feedback has been, the, the little bit of feedback we've gotten is that Submarine Wednesdays is okay, we can keep doing that, so I will. And that's what I'll be doing is painting torpedoes and snorkels and some floor pieces and some hatchways and things um, on Wednesday before making an effort to assemble them. I'm getting some paint off of this knife blade because I was cutting off, I was finding little bits of filament as I was painting and I was cutting it off usually after the paint had already been there. So just cleaning the blade. Yeah, so Submarine Wednesday on Wednesday, and then returning with sewer tiles. Well, on Friday, what I'll probably do is start out by touching up these. I can see, ah, uh, okay, that's going to be something. It's going to require a lot, of, lot more touch-up than I had planned on, but it also tells me what I was not being careful about, okay? I, had, I hadn't painted the walls and things in quite a while, so what's happening here is that I didn't get the paint. You can see it pretty clearly. I was not good about getting the paint down into the mortar joints, and that's not good. That all needs to be covered, so there's going to be a fair amount of touching up to do on Friday when I get back to these, especially the, the culvert sections where the space is between the stones, needs a lot of touch up. I'm looking at it and just, yeah, it was not, not well done. I needed to have gotten a brush into 
into those nooks and crannies a lot better than I did. These flat floors like this, you know, for the most part are looking okay. I just need to touch up the edges like this one, you know, where the paint came off when I peeled them off of the stand. So those will go pretty fast. So we have submarine Wednesday and then on Friday, touching up sewer tiles, finding a place to set them. And then I've got one, two, three, four more racks of two dozen each. 24 times four, that many. 12 times 90, 96 of them, yep. 96 more to go. Most of which are the flat ones. Um, looks like two dozen of which are the culverts. And I'll be much more careful with the culverts than I was this time, so that the touch-up doesn't take as much time as it will this time around. So there. Uh, yeah, that was relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons Monday version. Uh, it was successful. I did some flips. We had precipitation. I don't know if we'll have it on Wednesday or not. We'll see. It's been kind of a tradition to do that. I kept things on camera most of the time. I finished the uh, mace carrying archer minifigs that finished those before break. And now, yeah, talked about Europe, talked about healthcare, talked about taxes, talked about Vikings. Drank out of my official Dyson Dungeons mug. And I will welcome you all back to Relaxing Painting with Dyson Dungeons on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 10 more or less until 2 more or less with a break in between. And to our Dungeons and Dragons uh, campaign, which streams on Twitch on Sundays at 2. Uh, please feel free. It's not free please consider becoming a follower or a subscriber or even going to patreon.com slash dice and dungeons and becoming a patron. Thank you for watching. Thanks for your support. And we'll see you on Wednesday morning as we resume submarining.